Hi, I'm Pastor Cheryl Pickford. I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, this message today continues our series titled Lies from the Pit of Hell. Today we're going to be looking at easy believism. You know, when something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Salesmen often promise us the moon, but neglect the fine print details in order to close a sale. Have you ever been approached by a timeshare salesman while you're on vacation? Well, owning a timeshare is easy and affordable, right? There's no mention of blackout dates or how difficult it is to extract oneself from the contract that you just signed. Just easy monthly payments without any mention of capital improvement fees, cleaning fees, and general maintenance fees. You know, P.T. Barnum said a sucker is born every day. And it's very easy to be sucked into something that sounds like a great deal, but with hidden fees and complications. So what does this all have to do with Christianity? Well, the devil often tries to sell us a pack of lies concerning our salvation. Lies such as, if you simply recite this prayer, you're saved. You can live any way you please. You've got your golden ticket to heaven. Nothing you do will ever be held against you on Judgment Day. Yeah. Salvation is not fire insurance, my friends. You cannot just recite an incantation and then live as you choose with a secured eternity in heaven. Such easy believism is a lie from the pit of hell. As we get started, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for revealing these truths in your word. And Lord, I pray that anyone within the sound of my voice that has been sucked into this easy believism mentality would repent from that and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, I give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today can be found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3-8, through 8, and I'm reading from the New Living Testament, okay, starting in verse 3. God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this manner by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins, as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Paul wrote these guidelines to the early church in Thessalonica, and they haven't changed over the years. Salvation is a matter of the heart, not reciting a few words and attesting to believe in Christ without any signs of a life change. As Paul says in verse 7, God has called us believers to live holy lives, not impure lives. So are you leading a holy life? Today we're going to take a look at three things that God expects from those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. They are commitment, submission, and faithfulness. Now, God expects commitment. Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. This is the Amplified Bible. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, believing in me as master and teacher, and allow the spiritually dead to bury their own dead. You know, our commitment to Christ must be complete. It's possible that this disciple was not asking for permission to go to his father's funeral, but rather to delay following Jesus until after his elderly father had died. It's also possible that he was the firstborn son and wanted to claim his inheritance, or perhaps his father was entrenched in Judaism and would have been angry over his son following an itinerant preacher. Whatever his concern, he did not want to make a commitment to Christ just yet. Jesus, however, did not accept his excuse. My friends, today is the day of salvation. When the Holy Spirit is nudging on your heart, 
Don't delay in making a commitment to Christ. Now, Jesus was always direct with those who wanted to follow him. He made sure that they counted the cost and set aside any conditions that they might have for following him. As God's son, Jesus did not hesitate to demand complete loyalty. Even family loyalty was not to take priority over the demands of obedience. His direct challenge forces us to ask ourselves about our own priorities in following him. The decision to follow Jesus should not be put off, even though other loyalties compete for our attention. Nothing should be placed above a total commitment to Christ. We often hear, yeah, it's our job to catch the fish and the Holy Spirit's job to clean the fish. Well, I also believe that people should have an idea of God's expectation. And that is why discipleship is so important in being invested in a solid Bible-believing church. I caution you, not all gatherings under the title of church are solid Christian and Bible-believing. Many churches have adopted societal standards over biblical standards. Be very careful when choosing a church and make sure that it lines up with what the Bible teaches. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 from the New Living Testament reads, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Our commitment to God must be consistent. The people had to decide whether they would obey the Lord who had proven his trustworthiness or obey the local man-made idols. It's easy to lapse back into, into going about life on your own way. But the time comes when you have to choose who or what will control you. In taking a definite stand for the Lord, Joshua again displayed his spiritual leadership. Regardless of what others decided, Joshua made a commitment to God, and he was willing to set the example of living by that decision. The way we live shows others the strength of our commitment to serving God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 from the Amplified Bible reads, But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God expects believers to be committed to Christ. But you see, Christ committed himself to us first. While we were still sinners, God sent Jesus Christ to die for us. Not because we were good enough or just, just because that he loved us. So whenever you feel uncertain about God's love for you, remember that he loved you even before you turned to him. If God loved you when you were a rebel, he can certainly strengthen you now that you love him in return. Psalm 37.5 in the New Living Testament reads, Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Commitment is the beginning of trusting God. David calls us to take delight in the Lord and to commit everything we have and do to him. But how do we do this? Well, to be delighted in someone means to experience great pleasure and joy in his or her presence. This happens only when we know that person well. Thus, to delight in the Lord, we must know him better. Knowledge of God's great love for us will indeed give us delight. And to commit everything to the Lord means entrusting our life our family, our job, and all of our possessions to his control and guidance. To commit ourselves to the Lord means to trust in him, believing that he can care for us better than we can for ourselves. We should be willing to wait patiently for him to work out what's best for us. Now, besides commitment, God also expects submission. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. This act of obedience requires submission. <laughs> we don't like that word very much, but submission to Christ's lordship is central to Christianity. 
Luke chapter 14 verse 27 from the Amplified Bible. Whoever does not carry his own cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow after me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if needed, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me, cannot be my disciple. Well, Jesus' audience was well aware of what it meant to carry one's cross. When the Romans led a criminal to his ex execution site, he was forced to carry the cross on which he would die. This showed submission to Rome and it warned observers that they had better submit to Rome as well. Jesus spoke this teaching to get the crowds to think through their enthusiasm for him. He encouraged those who were superficial either to go deeper or turn back. Following Christ means total submission to him, perhaps even to the point of death. Well, biblical submission is choosing to obey and glorify God in our relationships. God created lines of authority in order for his created world to function smoothly. And although there must be lines of authority, even in marriage, there should not be lines of superiority. God created men and women with unique and complementary characteristics. One sex is not better than the other. We must not allow the issue of authority and submission to become a wedge to destroy oneness in marriage. Instead, we should use our unique gifts to strengthen our marriage and glorify God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Biblical submission is a mark of equality rather than inequality. Submitting to another person is often a misunderstood concept. It does not mean becoming a doormat. Christ, at whose name every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, submitted his will to the Father, and we honor Christ by following his example. When we submit to God, we become more willing to obey his command to submit to others, that is, to subordinate our rights to theirs. In a marriage relationship, both husband and wife are called to submit to one another. For the wife, this means willingly following her husband's leadership in Christ. For the husband, it means putting aside his own interest in order to care for his wife. Submission is rarely a problem in homes where both partners have a strong relationship with Christ and where each other is concerned for the happiness of the other. Biblical submission will not be understood by people who refuse to submit to God. Although some people have distorted Paul's teaching on submission by giving unlimited authority to husbands, we cannot get around it. Paul told wives to submit to their husbands. The fact that a teaching is not popular is no reason to discard it. According to the Bible, the man is the spiritual head of the family, and the wife should acknowledge his leadership. But real spiritual leadership involves service. Jesus Christ served the disciples, even to the point of washing their feet, so the husband is to serve his wife. A wise and Christ-honoring husband will not take advantage of his leadership role, and a wise and Christ-honoring wife will not try to undermine her husband's leadership. Either approach causes disunity and friction in marriage. We've seen that God expects commitment and that he expects submission. Now we will see that he also expects faithfulness. Faithfulness should be a characteristic of God's people. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 50 in the Amplified Bible. Salt is good and useful, but if salt has lost its saltiness or purpose, how will you make it salty? Have salt within yourselves continually and be at peace with one another. Jesus used salt to illustrate the qualities that should be found in his people. One, we should remember God's faithfulness, just as salt used with a sacrifice recalled God's covenant in his people in Leviticus 2.13. Two, Two, we should make a difference in the flavor of the world that we live in, 
just as salt changes meat's flavor. Three, we should counteract the moral decay in society, just as salt preserves food from decay. When we lose this desire to salt the earth with the love and message of God, we become useless to him. 1 Kings 19.10 in the New Living Testament Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. While despite how dark and sin-soaked the world appears, we can take comfort in the fact that God always, always has a remnant of faithful followers. Elijah thought he was the only person left who was still faithful to God. He had seen both the king's court and the priesthood become corrupt. And after experiencing great victory on Mount Carmel, he had to run for his life. Lonely and discouraged, he thought that no others had remained faithful during the nation's wickedness. When you are tempted to think that you are the only one remaining faithful to a task, don't stop to feel sorry for yourself. Self-pity will dilute the good that you're doing. Be assured that even if you don't know who they are, others are faithfully obeying God and fulfilling their duties. We can take comfort and encouragement in knowing that we are not alone in faithfully following God. God wants faithful believers, those who will stand on his promises despite how desperate the world around them appears. He'll reward those who firmly plant their feet and stand firm in spite of enemy attacks and the enemy's deceptions. We are not to surrender to the enemy but to stand firm, clothed in our Ephesians 6 armor. So today, my friends, we've looked at God's expectation of commitment, submission, and faithfulness. Where do you fall in following these standards? Does your life reflect a true change of direction once you began following the Lord? Or hmm, do you view salvation as a fire insurance policy? It's time to get right with God if you haven't already. Now, I believe Jesus is coming soon for his church. He may be coming sooner for you. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, and only God knows when that judgment will be. Those who are not committed to faithfully following Christ in true submission will suffer greatly when the true church is removed from the earth. May each of us be counted worthy for the rapture of the saints. My friends, may God bless you until we meet again.